You want to see the experience, comic culture, and sales. Streaming live daily to Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Yesterday was interesting for me. I don't know about you guys, but with the pandemic, going to the theater became a rare thing. I mean, it was they were closed for the longest time. And even once they opened up, I didn't really get out to the theater that much. Um, you know, a couple times here or there. And then last year in February, when I saw Death on the Nile, and I realized that I didn't get back to the theater until yesterday. So I've been out of it for about a year. And... Uh, Forgot just how much I liked it, how much, how nice it was just to sit in a room and not play on your phone, not have distractions, and up on the big screen and watch the movie. And that was really nice. I've missed it. So now, of course, what I saw, that's what we're going to talk about. Stay tuned. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Dan Wickline Show here on The Experience. It is Tuesday, February 21st, and we're pretty much just going to dedicate the whole show to Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania. Now, if you haven't seen it, there's going to be some spoilers, because I don't think I'm going to be able to do it without spoilers. So I'm going to give you guys a warning now. Cool, John, Triple B, by the way, all great to see you guys. But there's going to be spoilers. So what we're going to do is we're going to run that old spoiler warning. I think Jay has it. Jay, can we hit the spoiler warning? I missed that. I hadn't seen the spoiler warning thing in a while. So... So we're going to talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And we're also going to talk about the effects it has going forward, how it fits into the franchise, and whatever else we come up with. And when also just the, 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 the reaction it's been getting, which is blowing my mind. Now, I'm going to do another segment on the movie, but it's not going to be on that. It's going to be, I'm going to break down the Kang, Kang Dynasty, the Kang Gang, uh, who the different people are, give you guys a primer, but that'll probably be later in this week. I need to coordinate with Kyle. I know there's a day we're going to do something about Comics Pro. By the way, congratulations to Sierra Han, formerly of Boom Studios. She was running Arkea. And now she is the editor-in-chief over at Oni Press, along with Hunter Gordonson, who's now the president and publisher over there. So uh, glad to see it. Hope you guys do good stuff. Looking forward to it. And if you need a writer. Um, all right. So I, I think I want to first talk about the reaction that the movie has been getting. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been noticing that people seem to want to be negative about the MCU. Hey, Backwoods. There was a point, it, it, you, you see it in society. We see somebody rise. 
just out of the blue, they become beloved. And then they get to a certain point, and then people want to tear it down. And um, right now, the only thing that comes to mind is uh, uh, Cuomo, Anthony Cuomo, from over on the, the, the former governor of New York, who during the pandemic was all the rage and everybody was loving him and his, his, uh, his little press conferences and stuff. And then the first crack in the armor, and then the next thing you know, he comes tumbling down. Now, he did bad stuff, he, inappropriate stuff. So that's not near there, but you, you see it all the time. We like to, as a society, we love to build things up, and then we love to tear it down. And I don't understand it, and, and Marvel seems to be the current thing. You know, Um you, you go on just about every website and you're going to see, is the magic gone at Marvel? Is this the end of Marvel? How is Marvel going to recover? I saw one guy do an entire segment on his show comparing how Ant-Man did to uh, other superhero movies. He compared it to the Batman. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think Ant-Man is ever going to outsell the Batman. The Batman is a recognizable character world, world around. Everybody knows who Batman is. There's a built-in audience that doesn't just involve comic people. Ant-Man is a smaller character that some people have never bothered to watch his movies at all. They don't take it seriously. And, you know, it, it's not the same. Yeah, apples and oranges, exactly. So there is people trying to drive this negative that the movie's doing poorly or that it's the death of the MCU. And they seem to be saying that after everything. You know, after uh, She-Hulk, after Miss Marvel, after Moon Knight, it's just, you know, every movie comes out. It's the worst thing ever. Everything comes it's the worst thing ever. You know, uh, Wakanda Forever. There's a lot of people that loved the movie, and then there was a lot of negativity starting to come out about it. Thor Love and Thunder, not the best Thor movie, but a lot of negativity came out about it. And it's almost like people, they want to wear it like a badge of honor. You know, oh, I didn't like that movie. Yes, I'm special. I didn't like that. I'm not one of the, just the mindless drove that the Marvel simps that just, or stands, or whatever the current terminology is. And you look at the movie. Is it a successful movie? The best way I can break it down is comparing it to the previous movies. The original Ant-Man movie already had a knock against it because of the director change. Don't need to get into that. But it opened for $57 million. It made domestically $180 million total and $519 worldwide. Ant-Man and the Wasp came along. Now, some people don't think it's as good of a movie as the first Ant-Man. Some people do. It's funny. It's got a lot of the same elements. It opened for $76 million. That means that the audience grew. That from the initial opening of 57 million to 76 million, it gained that many or that, you know, that number of uh, more viewers. Total, it did 217 million domestically and 623 million worldwide. Now, that's a decent bump, but not a, not a huge one. I mean, just to go, I mean, because by then, Ant Man was starting to get more established. 
But he went up 37 million domestically and almost 100 million worldwide, which tells you that worldwide he's getting a lot better uh, press. So let's look at Quantum Mania. Now, we knew Quantum Manium was going to be a big Kang thing. But how many people know who Kang is? I mean, you're assuming if somebody watched Loki, then they will want to see what's going to happen with Kang. But there's a lot of people that didn't watch Loki. There are a lot of people that only watch the Marvel movies. They don't watch the TV shows. There's a lot of people that only watch the big name Marvel movies. You know, they don't do the smaller ones. All right. So... It opened for just the three-day weekend, not the four, because it is a holiday weekend. But since we're comparing, trying to compare apples to apples, 105. 105 million dollar opening for the three days. 120 when you add in President's Day. Maybe a little bit higher. I don't know. My money was in there. 105 million. So that means it jumped another what, almost $30 million for an opening. That's good growth. If you're a studio person, you're looking at that and going, nice, okay. But domestically, it made it's made $120 million now so far. That's counting in Monday because domestically you count the domestic total. So it's only $60 million away. from passing the first movie. And I'm thinking there's a better than average chance it's going to do between 40 and 50 this next weekend. Because there's nothing big opening up against it. And if it does a normal Marvel movie drop, and this one normally does usually does less than the normal, but if it does the normal Marvel movie drop, it's going to do about 40 million. So that's another big chunk. But let's look at it internationally, okay? Internationally, the film took in $240 million. It's already at $360 million worldwide. So, you know, that's, a, that's another big chunk of money. And it's only been out four days. This is day five. So you've got to, comparing it to the previous movies in the franchise, which for any other movie is exactly how they do it. You know, they don't, they don't go, Oh, Indiana Jones five only made this much money compared to star Wars uh, with Harrison Ford returning here. You know, they don't do that. They, they apples to apples. So, I think first thing you got to do is, and, and, and you have to realize that this is a successful movie. Even if it, I mean, as long as it plays out the string, and there's not a lot of big movies coming out right now. It's got a little bit of a window until the next big major movie. So, you know, now the critic uh, scores didn't help. The uh, coming out saying for you know forty three percent rotten on Rotten Tomatoes, but that's I think we we depend on Rotten Tomatoes too much, you know. It originally it was just an aggregate score, but it's it's hard to judge what they, I mean. They consider fresh sixty percent or above, and that's based on a five point scale, so it has to be a three or above. I mean, it's it's a really weird setup. But you look at the audience score on there, it's 84%. But you can't really trust that score either because you can you can uh, bomb, you can, uh, review bomb things. How many, how many movies have we seen that have gotten just horrible audience scores and they haven't even opened up yet? So it's hard to take that seriously. But a lot of critics came out and said negative things. But a lot of fans have come out and said positive things. Or there's a quote that I love, and I don't remember where the quote came from, and I, I pull it out every once in a while. And it says that nowadays critics 
use negativity as a proxy for insight. That basically they, they feel that they need something negative to say. They have to say, and, and every, you know, every once in a while, you'll see a, critics come out and they just love a movie. They gush over the movie. It's the greatest movie ever. And I know a lot of the audiences go to those movies and they go, what in the hell was that? How is that the greatest movie ever? And in reverse, critics come out and they just tear apart a movie. And then the audience uh, fans go and they're like, well, wait, what was wrong with that? So if you're deciding on whether or not to go see the movie and you're basing it on the critic scores or the, that kind of stuff, I wouldn't. Go and see it for yourself. Judge it for yourself. Hey, Kenneth. I enjoyed the movie, and I'm going to give you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because that's kind of my job. I got to fill up these hours. But you go online, and, and part of this, I, I saw this last night. I came out, and I tweeted that I loved the movie. I thought it was fun. It had some great moments, some great acting. And even some of the things I had heard negative about it, I saw the opposite. But of course, I post this on social media, and immediately people have to come in and tell me how much they hated the movie, which I also find fascinating. Because if I was walking out of the theater with a friend, and we were talking about the movie, and I said, oh, I loved that. That was great. And someone else would just suddenly bump in the conversation and tell me why they hated the movie so much. We wouldn't consider that normal, would we? I mean, you post something on, on social media and say, I like this movie. And nowadays, it's perfectly acceptable for someone who is just to pop up. And I've got a lot of people on my Facebook page, and a lot of them follow me because of my connection to the industry or, you know, a lot of different reasons. They're not always people I know. They're artists and they're fans and, and you know, and, and suddenly they'll pop up and it's, you know, oh, I thought this. Someone posted on my page that they thought, that the movie was good, but Jonathan Majors was the problem. And he suggested that this part should have been played by either Idris Elba or Rami Maya, Ma Malik Mayak from the last Bond movie and the Freddie Mercury movie, the Green movie. That's the only person I've heard that said John Majors, Jonathan Majors did a bad job. Yeah. So that surprised me. Had someone else just say they hated it. I mean, it's like, I didn't see anything in this movie that's, that could fall in the hated. There was, what, what in it was, I told uh, Jay, uh, Jay before we started that I'm still kind of processing my thoughts on this. And part of it has been the reaction. How does hate come into play here? I could get it going, somebody going, oh, it wasn't my cup of tea. I didn't, I didn't like it. I thought it was a little boring. I thought the visual effects were a little too much. I, it felt like a pair you know, of this or that. Fine. All great comics, comments. But to hate something? It, it, how do you have that a much of an emotional connection to a movie that you could actually hate it? Now, you could be disappointed. You could 
you know, there's a lot of people that like to uh, say how they would have done it. That's the other thing I've noticed is, uh, well, no, I thought they should have done it this way or, or they should have done that. I, I, you know, why did they just, why did they do this? It's like, really? Because, I mean, I'll sit here and speculate with you guys. I'll come up with my theories. I'll come up with that. But at the end of the day, when I sit down and watch something, I either accept it, you know, I, I either like it or I don't like it based on what's there. You know, I'm not going to sit there and go, well, I didn't like Ant-Man and the Wasp because the Fantastic Four didn't show up and I was certain they were going to. That, that's a horrible reason not to like a movie because you set expectations on such a level that when something didn't happen, then you get upset by it, you know? Or I didn't appreciate their interpretation of that character. Okay. Hate? Really? Who loves Modoc so much that they're upset that he wasn't taken that seriously in this movie? Is there a big group of Modoc fans? Because Patton Oswald just played the, you know, picked the character apart too. You want a serious version of Modoc? Play the Avengers game. But overall, Modoc is kind of a silly character. You know, I don't know what Jack Kirby was thinking. Little hands, little feet, big head. All right, I think I've ranted enough. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about the movie. We'll be right back. Did you know that every experience show, including some exclusive content, streams on Twitch? Check it out. Twitch.tv forward slash the underscore EXP. Or just scan that QR code. Imagine being at a convention and going to an interview panel that's just for you. No bustling crowds, no hours-long lines, just you, the moderator, and your favorite comic book creators. Well, this is pretty much that. Miss Jen sits down every week with two comic book creators for a live stream interview about their latest work, and you can ask them whatever you want. It's Talking Shop, Mondays at 5 Eastern on The Experience, Comic Culture and Sales. There's something for every imagination at your local comic shop. Visit ComicShopLocator.com to find a store near you. Welcome back to the Dan Wickline Show here on The Experience. We are going to be talking about Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Uh, guys, stick around. we got a good lineup today. we got got uh, 
In the stores this week, where Kyle, Jay, and I will be talking about the book's shipping. And then Minute to Skim It, where the crew from Space Cadets grab the latest books and do a quick review of them. So you guys can have a good idea of what, uh, what you might want to pick up at the store and maybe be introduced to some new titles. After that, we've got Mint Hunter and Country Road Comics. So it's a good lineup tonight, so you'll want to stick around. All right, and remember to hit the, uh, the thumbs up button, the like and the subscribe buttons. And if you're on YouTube, you definitely want to subscribe because we're, once we hit 1,500, we're going to be giving away a whole bunch of uh, CGG, CGC graded comics, and uh, you'll want to get one. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. All right, let's talk about the movie itself. Um, I, I, I was only a little put off by the half hour of trailers. I forgot about that part. I know there was a lot of trailers before a movie, but I don't remember it ever being a half hour. But the movie gets going, and I love the fact that it uses the old uh, theme song from the Welcome Back, Cotter show. Because in the beginning and the ending, they bookend it with it. And it's both times, the music, the way it's played, they slow it down at the end. Bring in an interesting mood. You know, uh, Welcome Back from the beginning is, if you think about it, this is... It's kind of a welcome back to the standards, you know, kind of a, it's a welcome back to the character and the fans, but also it does feel like we've been away from the standard Marvel movies for a while. I mean, we had Black Panther Wakanda forever, but that was very insular to Wakanda. I mean, there was some parts out of it, but mainly it was all Wakanda and uh, Talokan. Thor Love and Thunder was off planet. So it's been a while since we had a story that takes place just right here on Earth in in, in just an average city. And uh, yeah, it, that lasts about two minutes, it seems. Um, but I love the opening montage. Um, and the fact that Scott's reading from it continues the idea that there's there we don't normally get narration in Marvel movies. So the fact that it's actually him reading books to kids is what explains the narration. But we get to see Frisco, but we don't see all of San Francisco. We just get on the side of a, of a bus. I like that, you know, because it's like, okay, we've established it, but this is not going to be here, you know? So it's, it's a fake establishment because in a way it's kind of foreshadowing the fact that, this is going to take place elsewhere. The whole thing is taking place elsewhere. We get um, we get the little thing with um, the uh, the the cafe or the, the coffee shop giving him free stuff because he's Spider Man, and Scott's just having this great life and everything's good and he's you know saved the world. You know, and it, it is really kind of cool, and it's a nice opening. Now, the only other way they could have done this that probably would have ha made fans a little happier is if it was Michael Pena telling the story. Because that's the other thing I get a lot, is a lot of people are upset that Lewis wasn't in the movie. But the fact that it all takes place, I mean, the majority of it takes place in the quantum realm, would you really, you don't want to bring the security tech guys into the quantum realm. That would be really weird. So, and and, and also this is a movie about family. And, and those are, I, I think they're just trying to establish the, 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 the core family, the Pym family. Which is funny because they all have different last names. <laughs> There's only one real Pym. Hank Pym, because it's Janet Van Dyne, and it's Hope Van Dyne, and Scott Lang, and Cassie Lang. But they just kind of went, okay, we're going to focus on these and push everybody else out. Because you don't want to just have them in there for no apparent reason. I mean, yes, we got a cameo from um, Jimmy Woo, which was great. That was awesome, the magic thing. 
Um, but this was about this little family. And in a way, it was kind of Swiss Family Robinson in the in the in the quantum realm, or the I want to say microverse, because that's growing up, that was the name of us, the microverse, but it's the quantum realm. You know, these they end up stranded in the quantum realm, and it's kind of that idea of a movie. It's it's kind of you know, those old family shipwreck on a deserted island or on the island with natives. And so I understand why they did that. And I liked how they put it together. I liked how we're finding the connections between Cassie and Hank. I love that connection. And the fact she calls him Grandpa Hank. It's like he he's he's not your grandpa in any, you know, legal. I mean, he's not even Scott's dad, but he's kind of taken that patriarchal, you know, the, 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 the grandfather role, Janet's got the grandmother role, you got Cassie, you got the dad and the mom with Hope and Janet, or Hope and uh, Scott, even though she's got a mom, you know, Cassie's got a mom and a stepfather and all that stuff. This is like her new surrogate family. And it's probably one that she fits in best with. Um, I should say Catherine Newton did an amazing job. Because it doesn't take long for you to accept her as Cassie, you know, um, and she makes a lot of valid points. She calls Scott out on his BS um, and, and isn't happy the fact that he's come back from saving the world, but he's not done anything since, you know, he's kind of living off that laurel where she sees the world. It's like, it's not really safe. Yes, we're still here. but. There are all the people who were blipped away and came back to find their entire lives gone. And there's, you know, the housing problems and all this stuff. You have to, you know, see, I mean, from her point of view, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. She idolized him as a hero and then had to accept him that he's just an average guy again. And, and I think that's the thing about the Ant-Man movies that, that really stand out to me, and it, it stood out specifically in this movie for me, is that Scott, unlike just about any other character in the MCU, is the everyman. You know, he's, he's smart enough to have an engineering degree, a master's degree in engineering, electrical engineering. But outside of that, He's hanging around with much smarter people. He is just, you know, he got caught. He's a good thief. Um, but he's just an average guy. He's not a super soldier. He's not a high-tech billionaire genius. He's not the god of thunder. He's not even ex-military. I mean, at least when you look at guys like Moon Knight or Falcon, they have a military background. This is a guy who basically is willing to jump into a fight to protect those he loves and to do the right thing, you know? And we saw it a couple times. He got pushed. You know, his focus was to protect Cassie. But there was a couple times he still pushed to do the right thing, you know. And I am surprised by his arc, his story arc, because he had a lot of heroic moments. Moments where, I mean, he takes on Kang. He's not in the same field. He's not in the same level. Uh, I was it? Uh, Kang tells him he's outclassed. And as a boxing term, he is. Ant-Man is a featherweight or a bantamweight. And Kang is a heavy, heavy hitter. So for the fact that he's willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kang is really impressive. And that's something I really like about the character. But 
the other thing I really liked about the movie, another thing I really liked about the movie is that everybody got their moment to be a hero. This was an ensemble piece in a lot of ways. Hope had her moment. Janet had hers. Cassie had hers. Hank. I loved that Hank had his moment. And it wasn't about him, oh, one last shrink to save lives and then he dies of a heart attack. Or It wasn't like that. It was him using his intellect and his love of ants to save the day, you know, and I liked that. I liked that it didn't do the cliche. Um, it didn't do the things that everybody expected. Oh, they're going to kill this character. They're going to kill that character. Oh, this is going to happen. We had Endgame. Endgame was heart-wrenching. Infinity War was heart-wrenching. I don't want Ant-Man to be heart-wrenching. I want Ant-Man to be the story of the average guy that gets caught up in this world and shows that he is as strong as anybody. Is that he will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Captain America or, you know, stand beside Captain America and go up against Iron Man. That he'll run in and fight in the middle of a battle with aliens and Thanos. I mean, that's the thing is that you can't question Scott's courage. Because over and over again, we see that he is courageous. He's a bit awkward and goofy and, you know, comes up with silly ideas. But he's got the heart of a lion. You know, he's willing to charge in and do whatever is needed and sacrifice himself if it's going to save people. And to me, that's an amazing character. You know, he's not full of super soldier serum and he's not, you know, doesn't have superpowers. He just, he's got technology that could fail him. You know, I just really appreciate that and that design of an arc, you know. So what we see here is a guy who has lost a lot now. He lost five years with his daughter, with her growing up. He, you know, he wants that back. And, and there was a sense that they were going to play up that more in the movie. There was um, some of the clips in the trailers made it seem like that was a bigger thing. But I think that also would have been a very serious tone. And you already had the seriousness of Kang, but you still wanted it to be a lighter Ant-Man movie. So I can see why they maybe toned that back a little bit. But I think, I think that was really good. I like uh, Scott's arc and there's I see a lot of posts saying well there's no you know, you know no humanity in this or no love in this there's no f emotional range I'm like I'm watching Scott through this whole movie fighting the urge to save his daughter and still standing up and trying to save the quantum realm and to stop Kang and you know, that journey he goes on is pretty amazing. You know, I think, and we, and we see that with all the characters, you know, Hank, Hank has just kind of rebuilt his life now. He's got this, this pseudo family. He's got his wife back, his daughter. He gets this surrogate son and his daughter. And he's become the grandpa. And he's, he's, you know, he's teaching Cassie how to do these things. In a lot of ways, to me, it's... Hank Pym was a great character in comics until the point where they decided to mess with him. They decided to give him problems. 
they, you know, then they made him abusive in one of the comics. And it's just, there were people that loved Hank Pym prior to all that, that, you know, I loved him as Yellow Jacket. I thought, oh, what a great costume. And, the, you know, and Ant-Man and Giant Man and all those. To me, he was a great character. And they tried to redeem him a few times in the comics uh, when he became a scientific adventurer. And that's what this in incarnation of him reminds me of, is uh, during the West Coast Avengers, he became a scientific adventurer, kind of a Doctor Who type. And he would carry things in his pockets that were shrunk and he had like all these things on him that he could just throw and use. And, you know, suddenly he needed a tank. Suddenly he needed this. And that's, I, I see that's where Peyton Reed has taken the character and Jeff Loveness and stuff. And that was great. And that moment where he comes walking in, that heroic moment, that to me was awesome. I love seeing that. Plus, I love seeing Michael Douglas getting a heroic moment. You know, because, I mean, he used to be the, the action star. He used to be the big lead character. Now he's more of a supportive character. But, you know, he's playing a hero who was one of the first Marvel heroes. So, so yeah, I liked the story. I didn't have a problem with it. Um, Jay mentioned that he didn't see, that he had forgotten by the end of the movie, you know, at that point in the end of the movie, that Hope and uh, Scott were actually an item. And yeah, I kind of got that feeling too at the end when they embraced and stuff like that. They don't play that up much. But then again, the movie takes place so quickly. I mean, they get sucked in and that whole thing, they get separated. I Is it even over two days? Is that like one day? So I kind of give them an out on that. Sure, it would have been nice if they would have had a little bit more of a moment. You know, maybe they could have been holding hands in one of the scenes or something earlier to remind us. But, yeah. But overall, I liked the character arcs for all the characters. I thought Cassie was great. I thought Hope was good. Um, she didn't get a whole lot. They could have given her a little more. But, again, there was a lot of people in the movie. I thought Janet was great. Um, the awkwardness of the scene with Bill Murray was awesome. Um, when Hank throws the, the the disc and blows up that creature from the drink and it ta takes out Bill Murray, I'm like, yes. So, all right, we're going to take one more quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Jonathan Majors as King. Be right back. Comic Collectibles is here for you every Wednesday with AR Comics for two very important reasons. To sell you rare, one-of-a-kind comics that you'll love, and to confuse AR with old man talk. You see, Rex and John are, how should I put this, um, ancient as the roots of the mountains. So every week, Rex and John fill in AR in yet another area of pop culture that he missed because he's too young, just didn't have the time, or just really doesn't care about. It's a real public service they provide. Come buy some super rare and unique comics, while old men explain long-dead sci-fi shows to a younger man making that confused puppy face. Every Wednesday from 6 to 8 Eastern with Rex, John, and AR Comics. Comic Collectibles, on the experience. Comic culture and sales. You know how when you go to Comic-Con, after Comic-Con, you go to the hotel bar, and there's a whole bunch of people playing music and dancing, and you've got Pikachu and Laura Croft Tomb Raider doing the cha-cha slide just down from Deadpool and Batman and Wonder Woman? That's every Saturday night over on the Experience Twitch channel. Join Taji Beats for the EXP Dance Party, exclusively on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash the underscore EXP. Programming on the EXP is made possible by viewers like you, or your local comic shop, or that Kickstarter you backed, or the publisher you like, or comic industry professionals who want to share a message with the world. Really anyone who wants to advertise with us can. If you're interested in seeing a product you know and love, or are creating, or are publishing, or are involved with advertised here on the experience and having your message shared with our viewers please reach out by scanning the qr code below or visiting our website and using the contact form 
go follow the experience on TikTok at the underscore EXP1 or scan the QR code on the screen. Our TikTok is like everywhere else we are, except you only have to deal with us for a minute. Seems like a win-win to me. Welcome back to the Dan Wickland Show here on The Experience. We are talking about Ant-Man and the Wasp, Wasp Quantum Mania. And uh, I'll save this last segment to talk about Jonathan Majors, who is playing Kang the Conqueror. And if you've seen the movie, which I'm hoping you have, a few other iterations of Kang. He's played... Um, well, he played He Who Remains in the Loki series. By the way, do we still have the spoiler thing up? Yeah, it's just cut there. Oh. Okay. So he played uh, He Who Remains in the Loki series. And that was a very Willy Wonka. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with the Willy Wonka performance. You know, that he was basically looking for someone to take over the time factory. And, uh, you know, Loki and Sylvie had to go through all the Oompa Loompas to get to him. Here, this is a very different character. Now, first thing is, I don't think he's Kang in the beginning of the movie when we see the flashbacks. Because... She, at one point, Janet sees into his mind and asks, who is Kang? And his response is, it's who I must become or something to that effect. So it sounds like he hasn't taken that name yet. So is he Nathaniel Richards at this point? Is he one of the other incarnations? Because normally Nathaniel Richards doesn't go straight into being Kang. He's got a path he chooses. It goes on. But the character is played with such an interesting level of earnestness that you you almost find yourself pulling for him. It isn't until he gets a bit psychotic and crazy at the end that you're like, oh, wait, no, that would be bad. We don't want him. No, no, that's bad. Because when he's, when when Janet first finds him and rescues him and they're working together, again, he's taking the time to know her, know what she loves, and he's willing to, you know, he's got his overall plans, but he's willing to carve out her existence in that plan to take her back where she won't have missed any time with hope growing up. Um, not destroy her, you know, save her timeline. So there is still something there. He's not a, the difference between, to me, between Thanos and Kang, at least so far is Thanos had his glorious plan. And he was going to execute it no matter what. In fact, it cost him Gamora. He was going with his plan. Kang has his plan, but is willing to make alterations to it for those that help him or for that he comes to care about. And I think he does come to care about Janet in that time. So that part fascinated me. Um, his interactions with Scott play completely different. 
he plays those scenes as a god. And I think it's an act he puts on. It's, it's, it's an act that Kang puts on. I think, or at least it's, he's changed over the years because he did stuff like, have I killed you before? When he said that, or are you the one with the hammer? He's toying with Scott because at the end, without anybody telling him, he calls him Ant-Man. So he knows who Scott is. He knows what Scott can do. So that is interesting how he played with Scott. And he could have gone the same route with Scott as he did with Janet, which is, I've been trapped here for all these years. Let's get out of here. I can do this and you can do that. But he threatens him. He takes it from a different approach, a godlike approach. And maybe that's because he got burned by Janet. I don't know. But he takes this other approach. And the way the the every time he delivers a line, though, I'm fascinated by it. You know, uh, there's a moment where he's got Janet back. He's sitting in his chair. He's got his power core. And instead of just going, okay, we won, kill them. We're out of here. He wants to know what she saw in him when she touched his mind. What flipped her? What was it that she saw? And to me, again, that's, makes this character more three-dimensional than Thanos was. Again, Thanos was like a force of nature going a certain direction. Kang is trying to be that force of nature, but he's still got the human emotions. He's still got that inside of him. So I thought that was fascinating. And I thought Majors did such a great job because he basically played three versions of the character. The above-it-all God when he was dealing with Scott. The version he was when he first shipwrecked and became friends with um, Janet. And that might have been because he didn't have his power. He didn't have his armor or any of that stuff. He'd been exiled there. And then when he's losing, I think we get more of the true king. Not above it all. Angry. Bitter. Um, will take offense to things. And that I thought was very interesting. Now, I also don't think that this Kang is gone. Now, we see in the post credit scene the Kang dynasty or the Council of Kangs or whatever they want to call it. And that there's plenty of Kangs we could follow. But I don't think we're going to change. I think we're going to see this guy again. Because what's the old rule with Marvel? No body, no death. He gets sucked into the, as the machine is collapsing. Where is that going to take them? We don't know. But it seems like there's another chance that they're going to get out or that he'll get out. I don't think you set up the character that well to make him a one and done, even though you know we're going to see other versions of Kang. I think this one will be back. Plus, we got to see the Immortus version and the Rama Tut version and then the cy cybernetic looking one who a lot of people seem to think is a Scarlet Centurion. But I'm not sure because if he was a Scarlet Centurion, wouldn't he be in red? Uh, the Council of Kings is a lot less fun. The Council of Wells from the Flash. Fun than the... <laughs> What's funny is the Council of Kings predates the Council of Wells 
the Council of Ricks, the Council of Reeds, which have all done this, but they all took it from Kang, which I thought was interesting. But um, but if you had to hang out with one, Dan, which one would it be? The Council of Ricks. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I thought that was, uh, I think we're going to get some a lot of fun with Kang. I'm even thinking that maybe Rama Tut's the bad guy in the Fantastic Four movie. Don't quote me on that. Just a thought, just a, a feeling that maybe we're going to start seeing Kang pop up in a lot of stuff. Like we see in the end credit scene, the other end credit scene with Loki. And that's pretty much going to be a scene from Loki because they've already filmed it. I think they just lifted that scene instead of filming it separately. So I think we're going to see Victor Timely in, and maybe some other Kangs in uh, Loki season two. But I think they're going to spend a lot more time building up this character. Yeah. And like I said, I think Rama Tut's going to be the bad guy. in Fantastic Four. Just to, because it makes sense. You don't want to do Dr. Doom again. You want to hold him off for later. And there aren't a lot of other, you know, they're either really powerful villains or they're kind of silly villains. Not enough to launch a comic or a new launch to relaunch the franchise. From. So I think Rama Tut makes a lot of sense. Plus, you get to take them back in time, and maybe that explains how they go from the 60s. Yeah. I'll talk about that on another show. Um, but yeah, so overall, I really liked the movie. I thought Jonathan Majors was great. Catherine Newton was great. I, I, I don't have any problems with the movie. I thought it was good. I'd like to see, you know, what they do with if they get a four, uh, you know, an Ant-Man four. And I hope Peyton Reed comes back for that too. Um, but yeah, I liked the movie quite a bit. I even liked how Janet kept calling uh, Hank Ant-Man in the movie. That was cool. So, all right, we're going to wrap that up there. Stick around in just a couple minutes. I will be back with Jay and Kyle and talking about the new comics and stores this week. See you later. Join the party. Head over to our link tree to find all the links for everywhere the experience is all the time. Mm -hmm.